Hey everybody, and we are back. Who is ready to roll on this Sunday night? We're gonna be talking more. Yes, I know everyone's surprised about Joanne Fabrics filing chapter 11 bankruptcy and whether this is something that was preventable or inevitable. As some have said, there is a decline of sewing and that means that stores and chains like Joanne Fabrics just cannot be supported. So buckle up, get ready for another another great conversation. Welcome to Sewing Report Live. I'm your host, Jen, coming at you from my sewing room in Florida. It has been quite a week since the news broke and we're gonna be talking all about it. I'm also gonna be telling you about a new tool for sewists. That could be a real game changer and I'm pretty excited about this. Plus, we're gonna have a, a little K-drama talk. We're starting a new segment called K-Drama Corner, where if I'm watching a K-Drama, I will fill you in a little bit because I do have an ulterior motive to get more people to watch Korean entertainment. I know it's a little bit biased, but welcome if this is your first time here. Every week, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, we chat about everything that's going on in the world of sewing. So if you're watching live or on the replay, Welcome, and if you are participating in the online community, I just have a few ground rules. Of course, keep all of your comments and chats uh, kind, respectful, civil, polite, and no politics. This is a politics-free zone. So welcome, and before we get started, we'll also thank tonight's live stream sponsor. As usual, it is the Sewing Report Etsy shop. This is uh, a form of independent media, what I do here. I don't really do a lot of sponsor or brand deals, so if you'd like to support the show, one way you can do so is by shopping the Sewing Report Etsy where you can find fabric and curated sewing supplies. These are all items that I've personally chosen. I pack all the orders, I ship all the orders, and I, these are products that I use myself on the main Sewing Report channel. And we are currently running a sale on some fabric bundles and notions. So check it out if you are looking, again, as we've seen some uh, trouble with some of the main sewing chains, shop independent, shop, find small Etsy sellers, find small businesses to support. If you are looking for fabric and sewing supplies, so this is the Sewing Report Etsy shop and I am uh, self-funded and self-sponsored here on Sewing Report Live so that I can remain free and independent and be able to say what I want here on the channel without any type of restriction. So welcome everyone. Yes, it's been another crazy week. I know since the news broke almost a week ago that Joanne was filing for chapter 11 bankruptcy, there has been a barrage of media coverage, which is atypical because big media outlets don't normally cover a lot that's going on in the world of sewing and crafts, so this has been quite unusual uh, just to see this, but it's been pretty interesting and I've been monitoring uh, the coverage of Joann's to see what, what all of these reporters and media outlets are saying. And I found a few pretty interesting articles that I wanted to go over, so let's, let's check some of these out. So the first one I want to bring up is from Wolf Street, which was a this is not quite a huge outlet, but I thought it was a pretty interesting article. So I will bring this up. So this this one I thought was pretty, you know, I, I don't know. I've been looking for stuff that I was like, okay, what's interesting to talk about? And looking for some interesting perspectives. And this one's, uh, it says brick and mortar meltdown fells another retailer. Joanne Inc. files for bankruptcy three years after IPO. And they kind of have a timeline of what was going on with uh, with Joanne. The IP allowed the PE firm, private equity firm that acquired Joanne via an LBO in 2010 to dump the shares into the lap of the public in March 2021. It all came together in one fabulous package. In the bankruptcy filing today by Joanne Inc., an old line fabric and craftsy retailer with about 850 stores in the U.S., it's the stuff we've called brick and mortar meltdown since 2017, during which hundreds of major retailers from the biggest ones on down filed for bankruptcy and most were liquidated. Plus cherry on top of the cake, it's the stuff we've seen since 2021 in our pantheon of imploded stocks. So Joanne Inc. brings it all together. 
a p private equity firm, Leonard Green & Partners, that had acquired an established retailer and a $1.6 billion leveraged buyout 13 years ago and left the retailer suffocating under the pile of debt that had funded its own buyout. The switch by Americans to e-commerce that then pressured revenues at its brick-and-mortar stores, an exit for the private equity firm via an IPO at peak hype and Hoopla in March 2021, that dumped those shares into the lap of the gullible public, followed inevitably by the collapse of the shares that wiped out those shareholders. And today, three years after the IPO, the bankruptcy filing that begins the process of transferring ownership of the company from the current shareholders to others, with shareholders getting nothing. Joanne Inc. announced today after weeks of rumors that it filed for a prepackaged Chapter 11 bankruptcy and that all outstanding shares will be canceled and that holders of the common stock will lose everything. They've already lost nearly everything and that certain creditors, PE firms, and board members will get their restructured company. So this article brought up a lot of good points. The private equity firm purchased Joann's for about $1.6 billion, then went public. They racked up a bunch of debt and then went public leaving the debt in the lap of the shareholders. And then they filed for bankruptcy. The stock, which is currently around, I think, 13 cents or 16 cents, last I checked, is going to be delisted. So the people that bought the stock are hold left holding the bag, basically. People are still trading these worthless shares today at around 18 cents. Okay, that's definitely dated now. Down the road, the end users of these shares, when they get tired of looking at that unsellable line item in their brokerage account, will have to ask their broker to remove those canceled shares. The company said today in an SEC filing that it had entered into a transaction support agreement on March 15th with the holders of its senior secured term loan facility and with the private equity firm's Green Equity Investors, CFLP, Green Equity Investors, side CF, okay, a lot of stuff there, and with certain current or former members of the company board of directors and with certain third-party financing parties that executed joiners there too. It said its Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing would provide for a court-administered reorganization pursuant to a prepackaged joint plan of reorganization. The trigger for the bankruptcy filing was the company's default on two loans totaling $1.06 billion plus unpaid interest. Wow, so they had a billion, over a billion dollars in debt. The transactions of the reorganization plan would result in all issued and outstanding shares being canceled and ext extinguished without consideration. Also, I want to know the executives and everyone that got got in on the initial IPO. Like, did they sell the shares? Like, what happened to their shares? Did are they losing out, or did they already like offload their shares? All right, the company becoming a private company that will no longer report to the SEC. Its long-term debt being reduced by five hundred and five million dollars. It said its stores would remain open during the reorganization and that employees, vendors, landlords, and other trade creditors would get paid in full in the ordinary course of business. Retention bonuses for executives. Three executives would be paid retention bonuses in about September 2024, which the board agreed to on March 15th. $535,000 to Chris Titulio, Executive VP, Chief Customer Officer, member of the interim office of the CFO, $371,000 to Robert Will, executive VP and chief merchandising officer, and $135,000 to Scott Sekula. I wonder if this is additional to his $400,000 bonus that was reported earlier, executive VP, CFO, and member of the interim office of the CEO. The DIP loan to fund the company during the bankruptcy proceedings it has obtained a debtor-in-possession loan of up to $142 million. The DIP facility will be secured by a super priority lien on substantially all of the company's assets. All holders of its senior secured term loan have been or will be offered the opportunity to participate and fund their pro rata share of the DIP facility. All right, got it, got it. All right, let's move on here. The DIP facility consists of a $107 million in new money loan terms. Uh, 20 mil $25 million of outstanding trade payables exchanged into term loans and up to $10 million via uncommitted accordion facility, according, allowing the company to add loan terms. 
Uh, the brick and mortar meltdown. It has been tough for years being a brick and mortar retailer. Joanne sells the type of merchandise, yarn fabrics, crafts, art supplies, sewing machines, etc. that anyone can find on the internet anywhere. Not only on Joanne's own site, but at countless vendors, including cheap stuff directly from Asia listed on third-party platforms such as Amazon and now Timu. Online, the selection is endless, prices are easy to compare, and it arrives directly at the buyer's home. And that is something that you cannot get by shopping in store. And a lot of people have been reporting issues with shopping online at Joann's. I've seen a lot of you in the comments saying the orders were canceled or that you had, yeah, you've had issues or that you didn't get all of your order. E-commerce is a structural change in how Americans are shopping for this kind of stuff. Americans are still buying gasoline, food, and new vehicles at brick-and-mortar stores, which is over half of total retail sales. But the other stuff has been wandering off to e-commerce. Walmart figured it out years ago and became the second largest e-commerce seller in the U.S. after Amazon and the largest grocery seller. But most of the rest of this, its stuff at its brick-and-mortar stores is in slow-motion decline. E-commerce will continue to wipe out brick-and-mortar retail chains and retail properties and thereby will continue to wreak havoc in commercial real estate as it's done for years. So I thought that was a super just interesting article. And, and they point out a lot of like kind of obvious things that e-commerce really does seem to be swallowing up a lot of retail sales. And there's not as much foot traffic at all of these stores. So, I mean, yeah, that's something to keep in mind for sure. All right, let me get some water real quick here. Oh, and all of the articles I will be referring to are linked below in the description box if you'd like to check them out on your own and read them. A lot of uh, good resources there. And, okay, so another, um, another article I saw, this is actually from my former employer, uh, CNN. And CNN doesn't normally cover this type of stuff, so I was like, okay. And they actually have an editorial written by a sewist so I want to I wanna share this with you because I do think this is also worth checking out. And they had some interesting opinions there. All right, so let's check this out now. So this uh, is an editorial. So this is uh, just someone's opinion, basically. And it's written by someone named Linda Gorov. Uh, opinion, once folks like me ditched our sewing machines, don't, Joanne Fabrics never stood a chance. So I won't read the entire article, but I do want to uh, go over some of the key points from it. And this is another good, good thing to bring up that less, less people are sewing now than in previous generations. And I think there are a number of factors that go into that. But, you know, this, this author Linda is saying that, and, and she, she looks to be in her maybe like, I don't, again, I don't want to guess her age, uh, but the, she appears to be maybe like Gen X, something like that. So as his editor's note, uh, Linda is a freelance writer and editor living in Los Angeles. Uh, the views expressed in this commentary are her own. Okay, so she's saying, I come from a family of Russian-Ukrainian tailors, notion peddlers, plus a milliner or two, and I'm fairly certain my ancestors would hold me at least partially responsible for the bankruptcy filing of a major sewing uh, craft store chain uh, this week. Joanne Fabrics and Crafts founded 81 years ago when my seamstress grandmother still had young children at home, blamed a post-pandemic sales slump for the downturn. The lockdown saw sales of sewing machines soar and stock sell out. But now that we're not making our own face masks or working from home in nearly the same numbers, many of our DIY urges are apparently on the wane, but it's more than that. My immigrant great-grandparents taught their children how to make clothes by hand and machine, so well that both sets of my grandparents grew up to own and operate small dry cleaning businesses in Chicago, where they also took in dresses, hemmed pants, and hung drapes. They had the can-do craftiness of people with practical needs but little money. These sor those sorts of crafting skills used to be commonplace. Parents passed them down, and when silent generation or early boomer parents could not or did not, home economics teachers did. Most people, okay, most women, who attended public at junior high schools in the 1960s, 70s, or even 80s, learned at least basic sewing skills and could advance them with elective classes in high school. Boys were welcome to attend too, although I don't recall any wearing aprons or thimbles alongside me. Unfortunately, those sorts of classes weren't available to my now college-aged kid who attended public schools from start to finish. 
Uh, she says there was an after-school sewing club, but nothing in the curriculum. Uh, ditto shop class, which seems to be history, too. Uh, but if cars are expensive nowadays, what's known as fast fashion is cheap, not to mention being environmentally unfriendly. Plus, it's cheaply made, which is the whole point. Catwalk trends mass-produced for low prices are and not meant to last. There are entire retail chains built on that premise. The result is that it can be far cheaper and far, le far less time-consuming to run to the mall and grab something off the rack for yourself or your child than it is to set up the sewing machine and do it to yourself. Add up the hours uh, spent uh, knitting a scarf or crocheting a sweater, never mind the cost of materials, and homemade items have become the luxuries and store-bought ones the, mar the bargain. Most people I know don't even mend anymore, and shame on us. So I think that's... She brings up a lot of really good points. I don't... So, you know, maybe we'll do a poll. How many of you had home economics or shop class when you were in schools. Now, I, I'm a an old millennial, and I actually did I actually did have um, both shop and home economics. I went to high school in the late 1990s. So I want to do a poll here to see, like, who here had home economics class and who didn't. So let's, all right, let me see if I can do a poll here because I want to know, I really want to know how many of you actually had had that experience and how many didn't so all right so i'm going to do a poll on this is for the youtube peeps here sorry i can't do polls on all of the platforms but i can do a poll on youtube all right so we'll do a poll about how many of you had home act and how many of you didn't all right so let me do this all right let's do a poll here all right let's start a poll all right did you uh did your school offer home economics all right home economics classes okay all right yes no and we'll start the poll now mine didn't i'm like in my 40s so i don't know about you but we'll do we'll take a poll and then we'll see the results later on in the show because i do think that is part of the the whole thing here is that you know a lot of adults don't know how to sew or craft and then they can't teach their children or grandchildren and it's also not being offered in schools. So where are young people going to learn how to sew or knit or do anything? Um, a lot of, and you see a lot of young people like the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas. And a lot of them don't even know basic life skills. Like they can't cook. They definitely don't know how to sew. They can't change a tire. So I do think that's part of like an overall trend of like not having the same set of skills that your ancestors did. And I do think that's a problem when you see adults not know how to do basic adulting and they, they think even knowing how to boil water is like adulting. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. I see people, they can't do laundry, they can't cook. A lot of adults cannot cook. Young people cannot cook. They can't, they can't write in cursive. They can't write a check. They don't know how to balance a budget. And I do think that a lot of skills are being lost a lot of really important skills are just not there anymore so i do think that's part of a problem okay so let's check out more of the article here okay uh so she says personally i crave this uh, crafting connection to the past even if i don't have the time or energy to pursue it on a regular basis i'm slightly embarrassed to admit it took me more than a year to notice that the joanne outlet close to my own home had closed at the same time, I prefer a simpler sewing store. And it is true. A lot of the Joanne stores have, like, a lot of stuff that's, like, not not great. Like, I wouldn't say they have the highest quality fabric or sewing notions. And then they have all the random stuff that I don't really want either. All right. Uh, run in to get thread. Run out with just the right shade of blue. I don't want to be bombarded by construction paper, unpainted picture frames, packages of glitter, and glue guns. Sadly, but not surprisingly, sewing alone can't sustain a national chain. Not enough of us seem to do it anymore for fun or necessity. I know less than a handful of people who can even do simple alterations, much less who can who actually do them. Although I also know a dozen cosplayers who regularly create professional level costumes. Their skills, like their outfits, are otherworldly. My own mom never learned to sew like that or really at all. Not certain why, but I suspect her mother was both too busy running the dry cleaners and wanted more for her daughters than to repair other people's clothes. I'm guessing grandma also believed that real Americans bought ready-made things rather than making them. Fortunately, my dad's dad taught him and he taught me. 
When I inherited my great-grandmother's Featherweight 221 from the 30s, one of the early portable electrics that somehow still weighed a ton, he's the one who showed me how to work the treadle. He also passed on the old wives' tale that people should chew on thread whenever someone sews a garment or button on them in order to make clear to the angel of death that they are much very, very much alive and those were not shrouds, and I do to this day. He'd be so happy to see my daughter, his granddaughter, and some of her Gen Z friends putting down their phones and picking up needle and crochet needles, if not needle and thread. Never mind learning from mom and dad or granddad. The newest generation has the greatest teacher of all time, YouTube with, with its tutorials or for anything and everything. They learn online, they shop for materials online, and they sell their homemade wares online. It's a good thing, however, traditions get passed down, even if it's not so great for business. A really interesting uh, editorial there, and I thought she had a lot of really interesting, you know, thoughts about w the existence of Joanne's and whether or not, like, just things are changing and the way people buy things are changing and the skills people have. And even if younger people are learning to sew, they want to do a lot of things online. That's why folks like me on YouTube have done well because we are teaching people from the comfort of their own homes. They can watch on their iPad or their phone. They don't have to go anywhere. And then a lot of these convenience things have come out so people don't even have to leave the house, which can be a good or bad thing in order to buy a sewing supplies. So a lot of really good thoughts about just, you know, why why businesses like Joann's are having a tough time, why brick and mortar chains are uh, having a tough time. All right, there's one more article. This is from the AP here. So let's take a look at this. All right, let me switch this up. All right, and this, um, this is more about pandemic, the, how the pandemic has changed uh, how people do business. Okay. Uh, this one says, uh, Crafts Retail and Joanne Files for Chapter 11 Bankruptcy as Consumers Cut Back on Pandemic-Era Hobbies. All right, this is by uh, Wyatt Grantham Phillips. Okay. Uh, fabric and Crafts Retailer Joanne has filed for Chapter 11 Bankruptcy Protection as consumers continue to cut back on discretionary spending and some pandemic-era hobbies. In a Monday statement, the Hudson, Ohio-based company said that it expected to emerge from bankruptcy as early as the end of next month. Following this process, Joanne will likely become privately owned by certain lenders and industry parties. The company added, meaning its shares would no longer be tra publicly traded on stock exchanges. Joanne's more than 800 stores and its website will continue to operate normally during the bankruptcy process. Vendors, landlords, and other trade creditors should also not see any pay disruptions, the company said. Yeah. Wink, wink. Uh, pointing to a deal it struck with most of its shareholders for financial support. In addition to Monday's filing in U.S. Bankruptcy Court, Joanne said it had received about $132 million in new financing and expected to reduce its balance sheets funded debt by about $505 million. Uh, Scott Sekula, all right, go, we know who he is, stated that the transaction support agreement marked a significant step forward in addressing the company's capital structure needs. He added that the retailer remains committed to operating as usual so it can best serve our millions of customers nationwide. Uh, Joanne's bankruptcy filing arrives amid both a slowdown in, a, in discretionary spending overall and during a time consumers are taking a step back from at-home crafts, at least relative to a boom seen at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Crafts, which did extremely well during the pandemic, have fallen into, back into slight declines as people find other things to do. Uh, Neil Saunders, managing director of research firm Global Data, told the Associated Press, noting that many are now sacrificing these artsy activities to spend money on experiences outside of the house, such as going out to eat or attending sporting events. This puts pressure on retailers with skin in the crafts market, but Saunders added challenges specific Joanne, to Joanne include the company's sizable debt and rising competition. Rivals like Hobby Lobby, for example, offer lower prices while casual crafters can now go to stores like Target for ample art supplies and kits, he said, adding that Joanne has also let its specialist-type service slide with previous staffing cuts. That's very true. There is still a place for Joanne, but it's going to take a lot of work to get back into a stable position. I think this bankruptcy was always inevitable, and actually, despite the disruption it causes, it's a very good first step for getting the company back on track. Joanne listed more than $2.44 billion in total debts and about $2.26 billion in total assets. 
in Monday's Chapter 11 petition, which was filed in Delaware, citing numbers from October 2023. Joanne previously went private in 2011 when it was purchased by Leonard Green and Partners for about $1.6 billion. A decade later, Joanne, still majority owned by the equity firm, returned to the public market with an initial public offering at $12 a share. The company was born back in, okay, we already know the history, in 1943. So that's interesting. And, I, you know, I do think they saw some very artificial activity back during the pandemic between like 2020 and 2021 for sure things were going gangbusters people had stimulus checks people were at home they had time to make things plus there was definitely i saw it with my own channel uh, there was definitely a resurgence a resurgence in sewing interest just because people were making things like masks so i think they definitely capitalized on that joanne's also had that like hey let's make a mask program and donate it to hospitals thing going on so Joanne definitely had benefited from artificial activity during uh, COVID. So the other thing I want to point out is that around, I think it was Monday night, uh, Joanne definitely made some changes to the board of directors. They didn't publicly announce it, but they, they did announce that they were adding Pamela Corey to the board of directors. She's a turnaround expert and attorney that specializes in bankruptcies. And I did notice that she has now been added to the board of directors uh, website and they took off another guy, Jonathan Sokoloff. They kind of did that quietly and I noticed that Monday during the show because when I was looking at the board of directors Sunday during the live stream, there were six board members including Jonathan Sokoloff and when I checked Monday, there were five. Pamela had not been added yet but Jonathan had been removed, don't know why and they've since added Pamela to the website. So here is Pamela, the latest Joanne's board member. And it says she's a director of the Joanne's board. She serves as a member of the board of directors of Burford Capital, a global finance and professional services company, funding commercial litigation and arbitration, where she sits on the audit and nominating and governance committees. So she's done a lot of things. She has a lot of experience and she is the newest addition to a Joanne's board members. I did read that she was getting paid like $30,000 a month. Maybe they had to save money on her, so they got rid of Jonathan. I don't know. Uh, so Jonathan Sokoloff is gone, and Pamela is in. And it says she her terms expire in uh, 2025. Uh, so she is the latest board member for Joanne's. So still lots going on with Joanne Fabrics, and the fallout has been widely talked about, and there is a lot going on. I'll continue to be monitoring what's going on with Joanne's, but that is the latest. All right, let's check out some of the comments here. I know a lot of you have been writing comments while I was reading all of those articles. Okay, wow, tons and tons of comments. Oh, and if you would like to, if you do appreciate the work I do here at Sewing Report Live, uh, you're welcome to leave chats. I'll try to read as many of them as I can, but even more appreciate it if you leave a super chat or a super sticker. I'm starting to get a lot of comments here, so... Um, if you want your comment to stand out a little bit more, make sure it gets read. You can leave a super chat that financially supports the channel. It's much appreciated. And as the show grows, um, I might not be, you know, up again. This happens with a lot of live streamers. As they get more and more viewers, sometimes it's hard to read all of the uh, comments. Okay, so let's check out some of the comments here. Hello, hello, everyone. Okay, I think uh, sewing is actually more popular now. I mean... I think it's we're seeing some popularity with like the TikTok trends and everything. But I think if you compare it to how many people sewed 50 years ago, I still think there are fewer people sewing now than there were 50 years ago. But I do think it's seen a little bit of popularity, especially since Gen Z seems pretty interested in sustainable fashion. I think that's one way where we can get the young people interested is by repurposing like thrift, you know, thrift store flips, that sort of thing. And they are getting more interested in it like that. Okay, hello everyone. All right, let's see here. I think it's sad that a company can just let their business uh, sink like this. I, I agree with that. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, here we go. All right, I think sewing is still popular, but people shop and sew differently now. I used to go to the fabric store and pick out a pattern, fabric notions, a come, home, come home and sew immediately. Yeah, I do think consumer... Just the consumer trends are shifting and the beha consumer behaviors. Like, for instance, I get grocery delivery. I think it's like the greatest thing ever. 
it's not actually not any more expensive for me than going to the store. So I think if you can remove the friction of having to leave your house, get in the car, go somewhere, and you can make it easier for customers, that's going to be very appealing to them. And it's going to be harder. You have to offer more in store that they can't get by shopping online. And I don't think a lot of businesses like Joanne's have figured out how exactly uh, to do that. Okay, we got a couple of Rumble comments. Okay, uh, Joanne's downfall is sad, but on the bright side, uh, okay, Hobby Lobby seems to have some good stuff. I got some pretty good canvas there. I probably wouldn't have tried them otherwise, uh, but still love them. Okay, I, I think a lot of millennials and Gen Z are uh, so in my experience. I can't afford luxury like items otherwise unless I sew them. I love these Sunday streams. By the way, thanks for hosting them. Thank you. For that okay yeah so a lot of us did have home ec but a lot of people didn't which i think is sad i i understand that like school districts have to worry about budgets and the money and everything but i think home ec and even shop class can teach young people really useful things in fact some of the most useful skills i taught i we did learn to cook we did learn some basic sewing in home ec i learned how to use like um you know, drills and like band saws and stuff. And my, although I've, I've gone over this before, my shop teacher was like legit crazy and he was like kind of weird. Uh, so he would like throw stuff at the kids. So there are some things about the 90s that weren't great, but there were some things that were good. And I also, one of the best things I ever learned was a keyboarding class. So learning to type. So to this day, I'm a really good typist. And I learned that in like middle school. And I thought that class, it was like keyboarding one or something, was one of the best. Look, being a good, being a, an efficient and fast typist is one of the best things I've ever learned. It's a skill I use literally every day. So I do think those types of classes are very valuable for young people. I took a basic business class. I learned how to like balance a checkbook and fill out a job resume and do taxes. And I think those like adulting skills are really important, especially if parents uh, can't teach them. And we have another comment here. Okay, not sure if I count as a millennial. If so, I'm like the last one, but I definitely had some home ec-like classes. We went to homeschool co-op though, so it was pretty normal there. So yeah, I think it's really great if you had home ec, if you had those types of classes. And a lot of people are not getting that. And then they're not their parents aren't, teach, aren't teaching them. And then they also, you know, so the only place they can go, like that's one of the reasons why I do the main sewing report channel is to try to be a resource for people who are interested in so things like sewing and embroidery. All right, let's take a look at some of the more comments. Okay, here's a comment about Joann's. I put in an order a couple weeks ago and still waiting on my stuff to come in. I also ordered last night because a lot of stuff was cheaper on Joann than on Amazon. The wait is terrible. Oh, boy. Well, I hope you get your order. Uh, my nearest Joann seems like a super busy store. I always have to take a number at the cutting tables and wait times can be long at the checkouts. Because they only have several people working. Ugh. Oh boy. Well, I will say the last time I was at the Joann's, um, they, mine actually did have a decent amount of people working. I don't know if that's like rare. Um, but the store I went to is like, it's one of the renovated stores. And they do seem to have like, they had like 10 people working there, which I was kind of surprised by. I'm going to get some water real quick here. But I'll, I'll let, let's put some of your comments up on the screen here. In the late 80s, early 90s, it fell off. In the 2000s, it started to pick up again. I think it skips generations, but the time we live, such different lifestyles and more demand for our time and money. And that's the thing. The, the sewing industry needs is competing with every other hobby and thing that costs money that people do. Whether it's being a foodie and going out to restaurants or like Netflix, like Joanne's like everything is competition now because of the internet and social media you're competing for someone's attention between sewing and doing like a million other things so I do think that's uh interesting to point out here all right I'm a Gen Xer and took home and shop all right awesome all right let's take a look at the poll dude to see where we're at okay so all right so far did you so I asked in the poll did your school offer home economics classes 84% here said yes, and 16% said no, which is interesting. I will point out, too, my viewer demographics here skew um, 50 plus. I've noticed about, I'll have to, let, let me look at my analytics. Like, I would say about 60, at least 60% of the viewers on the Sewing Report Live channel 
are over the age of 50. So I do think that really correlates to the poll results here. If most of the audience is in, like, I'm in my early 40s and I had home ec, so I, I can see why most of the people watching this show had home economics because most of us, most of us watching are actually over 40 here. Let me look at, yeah, let me look at my audience demo. Because, yeah, my audience skews, my audience skews, like, we're, we're like over, over 50. Okay, so, oh, wow. Okay, so my audience, okay, on Sewing Report, and it's interesting because the audience, the age demographic for the main Sewing Report channel is much different than Sewing Report Live, this channel. All right, let me take a look real quick. All right, so 45, okay, 45. 55, 65, 75. Oh my, okay, so this is going to blow your mind, guys. 90% of the audience here in Sewing Report Live is over the age of 45. So I can see why so many of us had home ec. Yeah, 90% of you watching here on this channel are over the age of 45, which is crazy because most of my audience on so and I can see why that YouTube consultant told me to split up the channels because I've noticed like there's been a real shift in like what people are interested in. The main sewing report channel where it's like more straight up sewing is I would say like 60% between like the ages of 25 and 45. I would say like most of the people watching the sewing report channel are between like, you know, like 25 and like 40, 45. But 90% of you here are over the age of 45. So I have a much different demographic here than I do compared to the main channel. All right, I'm 72, so I had those classes available. Yeah, so, and that's the thing. We used to have, like we, a lot of us used to learn those skills in school or from a parent or grandparent that knew them. And now I think part of the problem is that not only is this stuff not being taught in schools, but a lot of us don't have parents or grandparents who know how to do this stuff either. So a lot of these skills are sort of getting lost here. I took both shop and home economics. I sewed an apron and I still have it. That's awesome. I remember making like pillows or something. And then we made, we bought these kits to make stuffed animals and we hand sewed them. And that was actually really fun. Like I remember making like a goldfish, which was super cool. And I made something for my grandmother so they were like kits in the pieces. So you had to like, it was like faux fur. And then you made these like 3D stuffed animals. And those were actually pretty fun. All right. We got one. All right. Did not take home in economics. Okay. So we got one person here that did not take home ec. But it seems like most of the people watching now had home economics. I had home ec available, but was learning to sew and cook at home long before. So I never took the classes. So you learned at home. So you did. And I didn't really... Like, my grandma did, like, crocheting and stuff, and my mom was a little bit crafty, so I knew a little bit, but I'm actually really glad I had those experiences. Yes, and now they have to learn adulting, and it's funny, because I see a lot of younger people, like, on Twitter and stuff, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of myself, I learned how to make, like, spaghetti or something, or something, like, super basic, but to them, that's, like, huge, because they don't know how to do anything, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. All right, let's see, uh... A uh, home ec was available, but as an elective, during my years working for Joann's, there were several women that offered sewing classes in their homes. That's awesome. And I think we need to do more, like, community stuff, like, more helping other people learn to sew. Again, that's why I sew on YouTube is to try to help people at a larger scale on the internet because young people are using YouTube. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm here. All right, let's see. Uh, to be fair, it's been so long since I wrote a check. I don't even know if I remember how to. I actually had to write a check uh, to my accountant a couple weeks ago. So I still will occasionally, I, I still will occasionally write checks. Us real people still teach our kids these skills. That's awesome. And I will say, I'm very curious about farm life, but I don't know any of that stuff. Like, you know, working on a farm, I'm very, like, interested. I find it very fascinating or like, um, like I can do some basic cooking and in full disclosure, my husband was a chef and he also can sew and do a lot of those other things. So he has a lot of those skills and he's in his thirties and he actually taught me how to cook because I couldn't cook when we met. So I was pretty bad with that. Like I learned a little bit in home ec, but I was not, not like he taught me how to like actually become a cook. So now I'm an okay cook. Uh, thanks to my husband. I know. So we had kind of a backwards role reversal there. 
Uh, young people, young students spend too much time on mindless on digital games. Yeah, and I'm not really, my husband's a gamer. I'm not really a gamer myself at all. So I don't know. I took home ec in 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th grades, and I took bookkeeping in 11th for money skills. That's awesome. My children don't think they need a checking account. Oh, oh boy, they're going to learn real fast. What do they use in Cash App? What are they doing here? What are they doing? All right, uh, they, they had no home ec economics classes, but I took wood shop mid-millennial. All right, uh, Gen X are here. I had home ec in high school, and I loved it. It's why I still sew and bake today. All right, I think some people didn't learn to sew because they grew up wearing homemade, home-sewn clothes, and they wanted Jordash jeans. Oh, I remember the Jordash jeans. Thanks for the blast from the past, Denise. I'm going to mute myself because I got a cough. All right, no home, ex here, no home economics here, Gen X. It stopped one year before I was eligible, eligible. Wow. And it really obviously depends on where you live and what school you went to. Wow. I have two daughters, and they weren't interested in it growing up, sadly. That is sad. And, you know, a lot of things, like, I became interested in sewing after I was the age of 30. So I think it really depends on, you know, and sometimes you don't appreciate things when you're younger and then you're when you're older, you're like, wow, that looks pretty cool and I wish I'd learned uh, more of that. And my grandmother and my, my grandparents were actually friends with a woman who owned a, uh, like a wedding shop, like a wedding dress shop. And I kind of wish I like tried to learn from her because she was very good at it and she did all of that kind of stuff herself. All right, I have many. I have met, I have many young daughters. My two oldest are ready to sew independently. I just ordered them each their own Eversewn machines. I'm wondering how Eversewn is doing. I think Eversewn seems to be doing okay, from what I what I can tell here. Uh, Joanne should support more of the costuming crowd and yarn work. I don't need a three wick candle when shopping for sewing and needlework supplies. That's yeah, that's a good point there. I believe sewing is here to stay as long as humans wear clothes. So here's an interesting question. I have a question for you. Do you feel like sewing, because there's so many mass-produced clothing and most of it's made overseas, do you think, it seems like now sewing is still kind of a niche thing. Do you think it's going to become more of a niche thing? Or do you think at some point sewing may become more of like a mainstream thing? Like back in the day, sewing used to be something that most people know how to do. And now it seems like a lot fewer people even know sewing basics or how to sew. But because it's not a necessity anymore, now it's sort of like a, like a, like an art for, you know, like an art form that's more specialized. That's kind of what I think. All right. Oh, this is cool. In my family, weavers came over from Africa. The progression through slavery was to be a seamstress. I learned from my great grandmother, grandmothers, grandmother, grandfather, mom, and aunties. That's very cool. So I want to ask you, Monica, are you teaching the younger people in your family to learn how to sew? Is that something? Is that something that's in, like an important tradition in your family? And are the young people in your family do they are they interested in it? Because that's another thing is that as much as the older people in your family might want to teach the young person, it's also on the young person to express interest in that thing as well okay oh here's another i sew and so do so do my granddaughters who i've taught that's awesome my my daughter knits and crochets i think if you and that's a good point i think if you make it like a, a family tradition hopefully the younger people can see the value in it and have appreciation for what it is all right maybe a project runway type show for crafting might generate interest in sewing yard work again and there have been some shows like that. There was like that Making It show on NBC hosted by like Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman. I don't think it really took off though. And I think the Project Runway thing, I think it's cool. I've actually not been super interested in the show. And one reason is because it's like fashion sewing. And I do more like practical sewing. So I think it kind of depends on what you're like what you're into. Okay, here we go. All right, trying to look at the comments here. And by the way, if you would like to ensure your comment gets read on air here, if you do super chat or super thank, a super thanks or super sticker, your comment will definitely be seen. Um, I know we are getting to the point where we're getting more and more comments here. So if you'd like to gar if you would like to guarantee that your your chat gets read on the air, uh, super th super chats are appreciated. This is uh, an independent show. And I greatly appreciate the support and everyone watching. 
Okay, uh, Joanne's was more community-minded during the pandemic out of necessity, so perhaps they need to create a new business model. I would agree with you. I think they need to figure they need to figure out something new and something fresh. Uh, they do have all of that space in the stores with like the like the tables and the chair. They could do something with it. And you know, I know they used to do the classes and stuff, and they for a while they tried to make it like a hangout space, but it seems like that's sort of gone to the wayside. They need to figure something out to get people back in the stores uh is upcycling clothes taking more from the of the from scratch market yeah i i think there are definitely people who just do upcycling and like the repurposing you know and that's not something i've done a ton of because i'm not very good at but it does seem to have like there are different like niches within sewing of things that people are interested in doing all right, the major pattern companies don't really, don't try to put forth really great fashion anymore. They've had some stuff. I think, I honestly think the big four pattern companies could do more interesting designs. Like some of it just seems like it's like slightly revamped older patterns and not enough like, there's not enough like innovative patterns, I think, with, especially with the big four here. Uh, oh, this is an interesting comment. If clothing prices become astronomical, perhaps uh, sewing, uh, maybe sewing will pick up. I learned to sew because I couldn't afford the stylish clothing. Plus, being five foot tall is a challenge with ready-made. That's a good point. If, like, if it gets more to the point where it makes sense to sew your own clothing, it might. The other thing, though, I think another issue we have is that the price of fabric is going up a lot. The price of sewing machines has gone up. The price of all of the supplies so the price of everything is going up. So even though the price of clothing is going up, the price of sewing your own clothing is also increasing as well. Let's see here. Um, uh, my mom is a seamstress and my dad is an automatic. Is that like a mechanic? I started sewing and I just took my riding lawnmower apart and serviced it. DIY is my life. I watched my parents do their work when I was young. That is awesome. All right, Denise, I'm considering curating my own handmade wardrobe because I'm totally disillusioned by the mostly poly polyester fabrics that clothing is made for. Oh my gosh, yeah, that drives me crazy is seeing high prices for like clothing made of polyester. I'm like, you know, are you serious here? I grew up on a dairy farm, learned sewing from mom and an aunt in home economics. Also, 4-H was a place to learn. Learned tons of life skills on the farm. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. 90% of the things in a thrift store ends up in a... That is sad. Yeah, it seems like a lot of stuff you donate, it doesn't end up... It doesn't end up, like, going to the thrift store. They end up throwing a lot of this stuff out, you know. I think sewing for a larger portion of sewers will be more of a hobby or recreational. I always saw that people enjoy creating things for themselves and their loved ones uh, to wear. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. All right, we got a couple other comments from Rumble here. All right. I think that sewing will get more popular, or at least I'm hoping the draw for me to start sewing was the low quality of fast fashion. Now I can make a lot of basic items and make them higher quality. Yeah, so, uh, all right, so full disclosure, I actually was, like, up really late, and uh, Target had a collaboration with uh, Diane von Furstenberg, you know, the famous designer, and I stayed, I was up at 3 a.m., so I ordered a couple, like, little things. But when I was looking at, like, the clothing, like, they had Target versions of, like, the wrap dress and stuff, the fabric looked really bad, so I, I didn't even think about ordering the clothing. It sold out immediately, but I was like, this clothing looks really cheap. And even though it was priced at like 40 bucks or 50 bucks, the fabric just looked terrible, so I didn't order any of that stuff. All right, so I want to share with you guys. So I actually covered this topic on the main Sewing Report channel. So if you want to see like a more in-depth video on this this whole thing um that is on the main channel but there is a new tool for there's a new tool for sewists that I really think could be a great resource for all of us and I want to share this with you because it does look uh, super cool and if you follow the sewing report main channel you might have may have already seen this but it's this uh it's a web-based app called backstitch and I just thought this was a really neat thing and I want to share this with you this is not sponsored. I'm not, you know, I don't benefit in any way from talking about this. I don't know the people behind it, but it just looked really neat. I saw some folks on Reddit talking about Backstitch, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. What is it? So it's this, we've seen th a few things 
in the same vein before, but they haven't really taken off. Um, this is, it's like a website. I imagine they're trying to do like a, an app for like the iOS store or like the Android store, but it's basically like a way to organize your whole sewing life. So you can, so it says a better way to organize your sewing, plan your projects, organize your fabric stash and discover inspiring patterns while connecting with the community that shares your passion with sewing. So I actually signed up for this thing and there, so basically what it is, so it's like a web application that you can use on any device with a browser. And right now it's in beta. So it's sort of like a testing phase and you can sign up to be part of the beta and they're accepting new people like every few weeks. I actually got in pretty quick. I was surprised. I don't know if maybe they thought it was me and they're like, oh, let's let her in. I don't know. Uh, so basically a lot of people are comparing Backstitch to Ravelry, which is like a website for knitters. And it is, it does have some similarities. So it says Backstitch is sometimes compared to the knitting platform Ravelry, which we are similar to in some ways. Like Ravelry, we also have a pattern database. However, we do not sell patterns, just as the techniques and materials differ between sewing and knitting. So do the features and focus of our platforms. So it is free and you can download it for, you can get it for free. And what it is, is it's a place where you can actually kind of, you can actually like kind of organize your entire fabric collection. So you can digital have like a digital, like um, a digital fabric stash. So you can organize all your fabrics. It kind of helps you like figure out what you have. You can also upload or include all of your patterns and then it helps you plan out your sewing projects. So you can, you know, if you have a hundred fabrics, you can take a picture of all your fabrics and then have it digitally in one place. And then you can do the same thing with your patterns. But what I like about this thing backstitch, and I will bring up my own account, is that you can actually, um, there's a big community aspect to it. So you can actually, like, it's building this huge, like, database of patterns, like all patterns from big four to indie patterns which I think is huge because there is patternreview.com, but let's be real, that website looks super dated and I think it, it does have some like limitations and it's a bit clunky to use, but I like that this thing kind of encompasses a lot of like the best things we like about so different social media platforms. There's a little bit of Instagram in it, a little bit of Pinterest, a little bit of like Ravelry or like patternreview.com, but you can actually plan out and organize your, like it's got like a way to track all of your sewing projects. And you they also are adding new features. So you can actually chat with the developers of Backstitch and tell them what you would like to see on the platform. And they've been really trying to make the platform, make, do improvements on the platform and make it better and more of what sewists want to see. There's a huge community aspect, so you can connect with other sewists here. You can see what other people are working on. You can see what other fabrics and patterns they have. You can see what patterns people are do other people are doing. And then, um, I think this is awesome. You can review patterns and upload your own photos of your projects. And I think this can be very helpful to people if you're researching what patterns to sew. You can see what problems other folks have had, what people liked, what people didn't like what that pattern actually looked like sewn out, what fabrics work best. I can see this being really huge and I'm gonna log into my account so you can see what it is. But I did a video over on the main channel, uh, kind of doing like a basic walkthrough and I showed you guys how to do a few different things with the app. I just think this thing looks really freaking cool. And I just think this could be a really huge like thing for the sewing community. So let me bring this up here. All right, so. Here is my homepage, I'm sewing report, and it's cool, so you can see, like, so there's a lot of different sections here. I don't have any projects up, but you can up, like, you can basically start a project, you can, like, plan it out, you can make notes on it, you can put what stage you're in, like, are you in the planning stage, are you in progress, is it finished? And it got, you can also, it can help you keep track of what fabrics you have, what patterns you have, what projects you've worked on, and what you've sewn. And I think this looks super cool. So it's got uh, projects, fabrics. I uploaded two just to uh, try it out here. And there's lots of different um, information you can input into each fabric you upload or everything you do on here. Uh, there's patterns. I put like, uh, so here's, so you can either do all patterns and this is helping like kind of 
this is helping to be sort of a repository, like an aggregate for all of the patterns, whether they be indie patterns, big four, whatever. And I think this can be really helpful for vetting indie pattern companies because not all of them are the same quality. And I know there are some where I'm like, it can be hard to decipher whether the, pat the indie pattern is any good or not. So I think this could be really helpful to people. So you can sort between all patterns. You can do my stash. So I have the poolside toe pattern here. And you can filter, you can search for different patterns. Like you can, it kind of can help you figure out what pattern to pick. I just think this looks super awesome and I'm really excited to, to kind of play with this more. And it, this looks super cool. My lists, um, here's like things you want to do. Okay, this is like what to buy. Okay, so this is cool. So you can help you plan out your project in terms of what you have to get, what uh, notions you need. Okay, a to-do list. And there's a free version with most of the features and they are offering a paid version called Backstitch Plus. It's $5 a month or like 48, I think it was like $48 per year, something like that. And this is basically to like help the developers sustain this platform. It does cost money and resources to do this. Uh, so it's either $5 a month. Normally, I've kind of made this clear, I normally don't promote anything subscription-based. This is optional. And I do kind of like that this is like um. You know, like, an in, like this is not like a big company. These are two individuals doing it. And here, I'll show you the people behind Backstitch. They look super cool. And I actually talked to them a bit on Instagram, and they seem very nice. Uh, so here is the mission behind Backstitch here. So it's a platform for sewers to organize their sewing, discover new patterns, and share their experiences and process with others. So the mission is uh, we are committed to creating a useful, fun, and inspiring space for the sewing community with Backstitch. So they're getting feedback. They want to continuously improve. They want it to be easy to use and a place for everyone. I think it's awesome. And it's uh, these are the developers, uh, Guru Lindel Flatten and uh, Andre Johnson. Uh, they're co-founders. And one person is the designer. One person is the developer. And um, now I did see some comments on the video I put out on the main channel. Uh, people do have com some concerns about the platform. And here's the thing, I know sometimes we've gotten burned before where something starts out really great and then the what was like a good thing, like i.e. Craftsy, starts off great and then it ends up being sold to a larger company and then the platform goes to shit. We've all been there. Um, I think that's an interesting thing. You know, I do think that's a valid concern. Um, I did see... On the like community ask, oh, and let's go, let's go here because I do want to share this with you. Over on the, so they have like a discussion, like, or a my community tab, and then you can look at discussions or activity. So the activity is you can see what other people do are doing, which is cool. So you can see like someone wrote a review, these people are talking about something. Uh, but in the discussion section, you can also ask for support and feedback. And I did see them talk, the developers interacting with people and basically saying that they want to make sure that this remains a good platform. So I do think that people with that concern, I think it's very valid, but I do think these developers seem fairly committed uh, to making sure that they don't lose a good thing. So if that is a concern, you are welcome. If you join the beta or you want to join the platform, um, you could definitely bring that up. And I think they seem like very transparent and honest people. So you could certainly talk to them about it and ask about, um, you know, what their thoughts are to make sure that this platform stays high quality and doesn't, you know, doesn't get ruined by something like being bought out. So I do, you know, so they have been very open about the mission and they're very committed to making sure this platform is a, remains to be a good thing. Um, so a lot of people are writing thoughts and comments. Uh, so I do think they probably heard though. They probably heard that from people before. And, you know, if that's something that you, you know, if you, you know, but I would encourage you if you want to check out, check out the free version, see what you think about it. And if you do have concerns about the platform, I would highly recommend joining the discussion and then bringing that up to the developers. They seem like they're very open to uh, constructive feedback. And I do think that that would be something that they would want to address. Um, but they, you know, and again, I, 
I understand. We again, guys, we've been burned. We've been burned by craft. See, we've been burned by a I think a couple other things. And we've had some apps before like this where some, like, I think there was another one where it was meant for quilters to, like, kind of organize their fabric stash. That one, like, didn't really take off much. And I do think the success of platforms like Backstitch is highly dependent upon the user base. If they don't get a, enough people using it, no matter how good the platform is, it's just not going to take off unless a large amount of us use it. So... I do think this looks really interesting, and I'm curious to see where it goes. Um, again, I've been very 100. Again, this is not sponsored or anything. And, you know, if there's something I don't like about it, I'll certainly share that here. But I do think this looks really promising, and I like where it's going. I think this could be a real game changer for the sewing community because I think this is a social media platform. Like, it's not really social media. It's It almost takes out, like, the popularity contest. There's no followers. There's no likes. I kind of like that about it. So it's not like, hey, who can get the most people following us on Backstitch or whatever. I am very interested to see like what they do with this because I do think this looks real, like potentially really big because we could use something like Ravelry because it's almost like you go to Pinterest for one thing, you go to like pattern review for other things. There's some things you go to Facebook groups. There's some things you go to Instagram for. And I feel like this combines a lot of things into one platform. And I think... This just looks really promising. So, you know, I'm going to be checking out Backstitch and playing around with it. Uh, but if you've heard of it, let me know what you think. All right, let's take a look at some of the comments here. All right, I'm going to mute myself too because I got a cough again. All right, let's check out some of the comments here. All right, uh, I saw it on the other channel. I signed up and am waiting for my code. I see from my grandkids and can see my daughters-in-law being able to access my patterns and stash. That is really neat. And and again, I'm not huge. Y'all know I'm not big on the subscription-based model. Um, and the developers were, were kind of, they've been getting feedback on what people think about that and they've, they're very open to like maybe having like a one-time fee or something else. They wanted to keep it free for the most amount of people because they understand that it's, you know, something being cost prohibitive may mean fewer people use it. So they're really trying to figure out the best model for it. Um, I'm in full disclosure, I'm probably going to sign up for the paid one. One to see the advanced features and two to see to kind of throw some support because uh, I think what they're doing is really cool. But if you, you know, I would encourage you, if you don't want to pay for it, use the free version. The vast majority of the features are available in the free version. So I like that they didn't put most of the features behind a paywall. I thought that was uh, really cool. All right, here we go. Okay. All right, I haven't purchased garment fabric at Joann's in about three years. The quilt fabric is cute, but re reality is it will fall apart. I made three quilts, two with Moda, one Joann's. Joann fabric fell apart. Oh, that's not, that's not good. Oh, Bex, I'm still upset with, yeah, Craftsy, man. Like, and I bet the Craftsy people hate me because I've made some fairly critical videos about Craftsy. They're probably not, they're probably not a fan. And I used to be a Craftsy affiliate. I used to love... I was like the biggest Craftsy simp and I loved Craftsy and then it just went to hell and it just hasn't been good. It hasn't been good in some time, you know, and now they're advertising Craftsy like $1.97 for like a year or something. It's pretty, it's pretty nuts here. Backstitch does seem interesting. Good replace for 9,000 apps, websites, and notebooks. Exactly. Like a lot of the things I think we find useful. Like I go, I look at Reddit and Facebook groups for like sewing help or to see like what people are talking about. And the discussion section of Backstitch looks like it could kind of fill that need. It, it's almost like a Reddit or like a Facebook, like a sewing Facebook group. Um, and it looks like a really, like, I think it could be a really good community if they can get enough people, uh, to use it. Yeah, Craftsy used to be really awesome, and now it's like, oh my gosh, what, like, what the hell happened to Craftsy? You know what I'm saying here? It's pretty sad. I'm gonna get some water real quick. I gotta, guys, sorry, I'm so stuffed out. I don't know if it's my allergies or whatnot, but.
the, I, my nose is like plugged up like all the time now. I got, I, I'm thinking I might need to try some new allergy meds, try some new over-the-counter stuff. I currently take generic Zyrtec. I might have to try something else. I don't know. It's getting... All right, we'll take a look. Let's let's take a look at where the poll is. All right, so not too much different. So currently the poll, I asked you guys, did your school have home economics classes? And let's take a look at the poll here. Sorry, it's taking a minute to refresh. Okay, so 81% of you said yes, your school did have home economics classes. 19% said no. So about like what 80 percent yeah 80 per 81 percent of you did have home economics classes that's very that's very interesting there so yeah let me know what do you think have you checked out backstitch what do you think i think it looks really cool like it could be a really good platform to do a lot of different things and to also organize like your whole sewing life it's almost like a digital sewing planner and that's what i find kind of interesting about it and i think it looks cool the developers look like really nice people um and they're also on Instagram. So links are in the description box if you want to sign up for the Backstitch beta. And it looks, it just looks really cool. So yeah, you can, you can kind of see the developers talking to people. They're very open about it. And they've been very, you know, they've been very, uh, like, open and, you know, accepting of the feedback, which I think is a good sign here. Oh, you can also import, like, your measurements. I haven't done that yet. And uh, this is for, like, the... Plus, so you can see what's, uh, so you can see like, you know, so it can give you a lot of good information about your own sewing and like what fabrics you have, what patterns you have. But yeah, I think the pattern section, like, I think this could be, especially just for the pattern reviews alone, I think this could be super valuable. And another benefit, I think this could really be a good, I think this, this something like this would be very attractive to Gen Z and Gen Alpha sewists. And I think this could help a lot of new people to the community to learn from each other, to like get feedback, to look at reviews, to see what other people are sewing. So I think this could be really cool. Let's take a look at the, yeah, let's take a look at the activity here. So you can see people are uploading like photos and stuff. Oh, this looks awesome. And it's, and again, I think this could be sort of like the Pinterest thing. You can get ideas, you can see other people's makes. I think this is super cool. And it looks like they have a pretty decent amount of people using it so far. And I've seen a lot of people talking about it on, on Reddit. So I was like, I got to check this out. And, you know, you can feel like I think the search functionality looks really good for the patterns, too. So you can search by like, look how many designers they have. They have tons of designers input. And like, I think this thing only launched like last year. So it hasn't been around like that long. And a lot of people are already using it. All right, let me try to, all right, so you can search by like age group, you can search by um, like file type, uh, you know, what your, bu okay, you can search by measurements, body, you know, which body type it's for, okay, different kinds of stuff, book magazine, wish list, okay, you, oh, this is cool, you can search for free patterns, okay, that's cool, so if you're looking for free patterns, and also, if you are a pattern designer yourself, you could also upload your own patterns so people could find them. So that I can see this being such a useful resource for everyone in the sewing community. And I really like it so far. I think it's very cool. I think the, um, the interface is a little bit more modern. Like, I've gone to pattern review myself a lot, and I just find it, it looks like a 90s website. Let's be real. Like, it's very helpful, and I think it has a lot of good features, but it just has a lot of patternreview.com just feels a little bit clunky oh my gosh we just got a super chat holy cow denise thank you so much you super chatted last week as well okay so denise thank you thank you thank you this is your second super chat here on sewing report live thank you very much uh ravelry is still free and run by the original developers i can also sell yarn on the platform hopefully backstitch could become a successful community because sewing enthusiasts do exist that's right, and I do think that Ravelry does seem to be a good place. I like that the people behind Ravelry made it free, and they didn't, like, sell out. They didn't sell it to some company, and that's the thing. 
with platforms like this, if they, if you get, the thing is with, with any of these social platforms, if you get a large database of users, it's very, it can be very tempting to sell their data. You know what I mean? And I don't know about the business model behind Backstitch, but you know, a lot of times if something is free, you are the product. And I do, I do really, it is really good to hear that Ravelry is still kind of keeping with its roots. They didn't sell out. They didn't, you know, sell out, sell all their users data. You know, I don't know what their business model is. Like how does, Ra does Ravelry make money? I'm not on Ravelry. I'm not much of an inner, but like how, and I'm curious, um, let me know in the chat too. Would you be interested in seeing if, um, would you be interested in me trying to interview the Backstitch developers? And I can ask them some of these questions that I know people are curious about. Like, what would the business model behind Backstitch be? Like, how would they monetize it? Would it just be through, like, the premium thing? Would they try to sell ads on the platform? Would they sell the user data? Because I do think that's important. What are these platforms going to do with your data? And, you know, I do think the people behind Backstitch seem to have a fairly high integrity level from what I've seen. I've kind of looked at a lot of their comments in the threads and they do seem like they're trying to be very um, upfront and ethical about everything. But those are all good questions to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise, for the $10 super chat. Really appreciate that. And super chats and, you know, any type of financial support does really help uh, to continue doing these shows here on Sewing Report Live. I really appreciate that. All right, Sarah says, my school sold all the sewing machines since the students were burning out the motors. Oh, my gosh, by pretending they were driving all the time. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. All right, so let me know. Let's do a new poll on if you would like to see me try. And I don't think I would do it live just because I think doing it live would put too much pressure on these people. But I think I would like to reach out. And I'll try to ask them some questions. Like, I, I have some questions about the business model and about what they would like, what the end goal is for for the company. But um, I'll do another poll on the channel, and you can let me know about if you th if you would like to see me reach out to the people. All right, I think I need to. All right, I'll end this poll here, and then we'll start a new poll here. Okay, I think I have to end it in order to start a new one here. And now you can see the result of the poll about home economics classes. Okay, so um, would you like to see? An interview with the Backstitch founders here. Okay. Yes, no. Okay. All right. So here's another poll you can vote on. Uh, would you like to see an interview with the Backstitch founders here? And if so, what questions um, would you want to... And when I clip this part for... I think when I clip the um, something for, um, you know, like a highlight, I think I'll ask people in the comments to say... Like, what questions would you have for the Backstitch founders if I try to interview them on the channel? Because a lot of people on the main video did have some questions. They're worried about it going the route of Craftsy, and I completely understand that. Um, I think the people behind Ravelry seem to have um, really stuck to the roots, and they haven't, you know, they haven't changed too much, you know what I'm saying? So I can see why it would be scary to start using a platform. You know, you put... And the other thing I saw people were worried about is, and we've seen this happen with a lot of different things, is you start using something that's free, and then they change it up on you, and they put all of the features behind a paywall, and then you have to pay in order to keep using it. So it's almost like they get you sucked into using it. They get you used to using said thing, and then they put all of the features behind a paywall. I've been there before, too, and I understand how that feels. It sucks. I bought this, like, thing... A while ago that was a cool tool and I paid for it and then they put most of the features behind a different paywall and I was like holy crap so sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating too all right so okay so inter so lots of people say they would like to see back interviews with the backstage people I, I think I might try I know they're on like a totally different time zone so it might but I think I will reach out to them and see if they would like to um, this would be pre-recorded. I just think um, with them being like across, you know, across the planet and they don't seem to have a lot of video experience. I think I would, I think they would be more comfortable with a pre-recorded interview. Uh, but I'll ask them some qu questions that I think people would want to know. 
I know one way Ravelry makes money is through people selling their patterns on the site. So that's the thing. They don't currently allow that. So how would, yeah, how would Backstitch get funding to continue operating? So I think it's, there's a lot of good, good questions to ask, you know. The other thing people are annoyed by is like the Peloton model where you buy that exercise bike or whatever it is and you can't even use it without a subscription. So, you know, I know people are kind of, um, have having fatigue over all the subscription nonsense and I understand that so I will I will talk to them I think I will talk to them and see if they want to come on the channel they can answer some questions and see what the few like what their plans are for the platform to make sure that people um you know don't get turned off by it or that they don't sell it to some large company and then the platform just gets crappy which we've seen happen before so I think that's I do think that's fair. Yeah, free features are no longer free. Exactly. We've seen that happen with a number of different things. And I think people are kind of tired of that. And I think it's, I think it's very fair to ask, you know. All right, let's get the music going on again. We'll get the music going. And you're going to be excited because we have a new, I've got something fun for a little bit later in the show here. All right, so if you've checked out Backstitch and you want to let me know, I would love to hear what you think about it or if this is something you think you'd be interested in. I just thought it was really cool and I the developers seem like they've got their hearts in the right place. Uh, they're clearly very talented and they're working on improving the platform. I just think it looks, it looks very cool to me. Okay, all right, so we got a comment on Rumble saying you'd love to see an interview with Backstitch. Yeah, I would love to because I think this is like the new hot thing on the sewing scene and I have some questions I think I would love to love to ask them subscriptions are just taking over serious Disney plus I know pattern wait you have to have a subscription on pattern review now ESPN plus Peloton I know right I know I know if they can turn crappy into happy I'd be interested but I'm pretty bummed I know craftsy what happened to craftsy guys it used to be so good it used to be so good you know. All right, well, speaking of subscriptions, I have to talk about this. Oh, man. All right, so pattern review for the advanced features you have to pay. Okay. And that's the thing. It seems like every website, like, when I click in all these news articles now, more than half of them I can't even read because you, there's a paywall and I'm like I'm not paying for all these random website websites that I only need to go to once like I'm not doing it like I'm not gonna subscribe to like the Kansas City Star or whatever like I don't live in Kansas City and I think these media outlets need to figure out that most people aren't gonna want to pay to read their articles you know I'm actually trying to declutter the number of projects and supplies that I have, so don't need backstitch, but I think it's cool and super relevant. Yeah, I, I, I gotta get more into the website and start uploading some stuff, like whenever I have some time. But I gotta, I gotta figure that out, because it does look like a really cool, it looks like a really cool resource. It does look like a really cool resource. Alright guys, I've got something new to share with you, and I am really excited. Speaking of subscriptions... Speaking of subscriptions, all right, we're going to do the first ever. That's right, guys. I have re-upped my Vicky Pass. So, yeah, I know, I know. Another subscription to worry about. But I got to talk about this because y'all know I'm a big uh, K-drama fan here. So I want to talk about a K-drama I just watched this weekend and it's pretty it's a pretty it was pretty funny and I'm glad I watched it it's a pretty weird it was a pretty weird show all right so let's I don't know if you, any if we have any more k-drama fans in the house I am one of them so these are Korean TV shows guys and I just watched this show on Vicky called love is for suckers and yeah I got I got some thoughts I got some thoughts. I just, I was like, I couldn't resist. I, I had a Vicky subscription. I let it lapse because I was like, all right, I, I got to, you know, 
sometimes these things can suck up a lot of time and then you end up like staying up all night to watch K-dramas and you're like, oh my gosh, what ha- what ha- what's happening with my life? But there are a lot of shows on Vicky that I'm like, these look really interesting. So finally I caved and a couple days ago I, you know, got the subscription back. There are some shows you can watch for free. This is like for hardcore Asian drama fans, like, because it's all Asian programming. This is not like Netflix where it has some K-dramas and a bunch of other stuff. This has just Asian programming. It's got some movies and stuff. And I, they have some free shows, but the ads on the, like, if you don't get the pass, there, there is an obnoxious amount of ads and it will drive you crazy. So if you are interested in checking out Vicky, I urge you, you got to get the pass because the ads on the shows are just, they're going to drive you insane. So just get the pass. It's, it's worth it. So I watched the show called Love is for Suckers, and it's starring my favorite actress, Korean actress of all time, Lee Dehee, who is also in a show called Search WW. And it is about a reality, like, TV show producer. Uh, So it's about this gal. She's in her late 30s. She's single. So here's her on the left, and then uh, the guy on the right is, like, her best friend, and they live so... They live in the same building. She lives downstairs and he lives upstairs. They've been friends for like 20 years. And of course, like in many uh, rom-com type shows, she has friend zoned this guy really hard. So he's a doctor and he used to be a neurosurgeon, but he had a traumatic incident. So now he's like like a contract doctor. So he kind of does whatever. They've been friends since like high school or something. And this show, it was kind of a wild show because... So the whole premise is that she um, she starts off and she's producing this like cooking show and it's not doing well. The ratings suck. Um, also, she, you know, you find out she had like a failed engagement to this other guy and her show gets canceled because the ratings were so bad. So her boss ends up making her work with another producer on this like trashy reality dating show like it's like it's like the bachelor but it's like almost like it's it's on that level like it's it's not like a it's the the people on this show are not there to find love they're there to like for other reasons and the the producer she ends up working at i actually kind of loved her character she's this like ruthless producer who will do anything for ratings she is morally kind of in a gray area she does things that are questionable meanwhile our lead character is kind of like an you know like a she she's a little bit more like uh wanting to operate above board meantime this other chick just wants to do whatever will get her show the most eyeballs and I thought it was an interesting show because it really goes into like the the ethics of reality tv you get to see behind the scenes of this reality dating show and how fake the whole thing was and it was, it did have some comic, like, it did have a lot of, like, built-in comedy. There's a lot of, like, very superficial people. But it, it's an interesting show. They kind of, I would give it, like, a 7 out of 10 just because the writing really goes off the rails in, like, the last half of the show. It's 16 episodes. Most Korean shows are. And it, I don't know, the ending, it kind of goes in a direction where I'm like, I don't know. But I thought it was a overall an okay show I love the actress in it and I thought a a lot of the supporting characters did like were like I was interested enough in them I lost I'm gonna be real though I just the the lead couple I would I kind of checked out and then I was just there for the side stories but I would give it a 7 out of 10 not the best show I've watched not the worst show I could relate I'm a former tv producer myself so I I just found the show very relatable. Like, this girl, she's burned out from work. She hates... She doesn't even really like her job. And you kind of learn, like... She really does not want to... She really does not want to work on the dating show. She just does it because she has to. And I just thought... I I just thought it brought to light a lot of um, issues that a lot of shows in the West deal with. Just with, like, you know them being fake and then having to deal with a bunch of nonsense, the press, all this other stuff. It was an interesting show. I would give it a 7 out of 10. So that is a segment I will be doing semi-regularly called K-Drama Corner, where I will be discussing the latest uh, K-Drama I've watched. I don't know. Is this necessary for a sewing 
report channel. I don't know, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. All right, let's read uh, some of the comments here. Yeah, the show, yeah, it was kind of funny. Like, the reality did, like, they made it look as trashy as possible. Like, there's a bunch of weird stuff in it. It was kind of funny. And it was fun times. All right, here's some more comments. Uh, you can write projects in a notebook just saying that's true. So I, I think it depends, too. Some people are, like, paper and, like, you know, paper and pen type of people. Other people get really into digital planning. So if you are really into the digital world, I think this could be for you, referring to Backstitch. All right, Scotty says, I loved Craftsy. Now it's just the same stuff over and over and boring. Teachers bring back Gretchen Hirsch and Angela Wolf. All right, good comment there. Yeah, Angela Wolf is like a legit. She is a really good sewing teacher. I remember when Vicky didn't have tons of ads. I used to be a sub. Wow, I used to be a sub editor in the old k drum. Now the ads on everything are so obnoxious. It's almost like they're trying to force you into paying for the subscription just because you don't want to go crazy from the ads. The ads are like ridiculous. Like I can't, I couldn't even stand it. I could not even stand it. I'd love something new and different. I'm, I'm so tired of all the fire hospital and cop shows. Uh, too many decades of you and it's all the same. Denise, this might be for you. I think Korean shows are, so even though this show wasn't like, the greatest thing ever. It was still better than most of what's on like regular TV. So I, you know, it's just different. I think Korean shows are doing something, they're doing something right. I think that's why there's a lot of Americans interested in the shows. And when you watch these shows, you can see one thing I like about Vicky is that people can leave real time comments and you see people writing in from like all different countries. So I do think uh, Korean entertainment is getting a lot of international interest. And I think it's because overall they have like more interesting stories. So I thought this story was cool. And I, I could relate as a former news producer. The burnout is real. You're you basically kind of live at work. And that's what happens to this character. She ends up like realizing, you know, she has sacrificed her whole life for this job. And she doesn't even really like it that much. And that's kind of how I felt at the end of my news career. I was like, you know, I am bend I'm like breaking my back over this freaking job and they don't even care about you. And I don't even like it that much. So I like what I do now a lot more. All right. What does it, what does it come on? Um, are you talking about the show? Oh, so it's on this platform called Vicky. Um, so Vicky is a, an Asian streaming service. Here, I'll show you. And it's again, I, it kind of stinks because a lot of the best K-dramas are on Vicky, but you kind of have to like pay for it in order to get it. But it's hard to get people interested in it if, you know, it's hard to get people to pay for something if you don't even know if you're going to like it. But it's on this site. It's called a Rakuten Vicky. And it's got like a bunch of Asian, it's all Asian stuff. Um, I would say if you want to start off light and you're not sure if you want to, if you're going to like um, K-dramas, there are some on Amazon Prime and Netflix. There's even some on like Apple TV and uh, Hulu, Disney Plus. Uh, so just search for K-Drama on Amazon Prime or Netflix. Um, there's a show called Queen of Tears that's currently on Netflix that seems super popular. So Netflix has picked up a lot of really popular K-Dramas. Amazon Prime has a few that I've talked about in past shows. Uh, so if you want to see if they're interested, a lot of the uh, rom-coms are quite funny in my opinion. Um, they're, they have some similarities to like the Hallmark Channel movies or the Lifetime movies, but I think they're actually better. Like, so they have a lot more comedy in them. And I think the characters are like, the writing on some of them is really good. Uh, the writing on this show started off really strong and then I don't know what happened to it. The ending I thought was pretty, I thought the ending of this show could have been way better. Uh, but you know, I still enjoyed, I still enjoyed watching the show. Yeah, check it out. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah, like you might like these. Um, if you, if you've got Netflix, a business proposal was good. Queen of Tears looks really good. They also have Vincenzo, a squid game, which was very popular is on Netflix. Amazon Prime, they have a show called Marry My Husband, which was really good. Uh, My Man is Cupid, which was also really good. Um, what was the other one I watched? It was called like True, oh, True to Love. That one was good on Amazon Prime. Um, I don't have Disney Plus or Hulu currently, but they have some K-dramas on those platforms. So it seems like K-dramas are becoming a little bit more of a mainstay here in America. So you might be able to check them out. They are really good. They're fun. And also, I like that the viewing commitment is fairly short. These are not like seas 
Typically, Korean shows are only one season, 16 episodes, and that's it. So they don't, like, even if the show is super popular, they don't typically do multiple seasons. So it's not like you having to commit years of your life to a show, which is something I actually really like, in my opinion. I kind of like that once you're done with the show, you're done, and then you can, like, move on to something else. I, I appreciate that. So that's been my little K-drama corner. I've been watching Love is for Suckers this week. And I would give it a 7 out of 10. So, again, not that, you know, it is what it is. Would I rewatch it? I don't know. I watched it because I like the main actress, Lee Dahee. Oh, Search WW, I think that, oh, man. It was on Netflix and Amazon Prime for a while. Also, the one confusing thing is that the the licensing for all of these shows is very confusing. I've seen shows be on Netflix for a while and then they're gone. I've seen them on Amazon Prime and then they're gone. So it's a bit hard to keep track of what show currently is on which platform because they keep like moving and that can be a little bit frustrating uh, for me. Yeah, it is my guilty. Yeah, it's my guilty pleasure. I usually watch them at night like as I as I'm going to bed or like when I'm eating or something, you know, something something like that. So Okay, so let me check a look. Let me take a look at the poll to see if you guys would like to see an interview with the Okay, so Okay, 88% of you would like to see an interview with the Backstitch founders. Okay, so this week I will be reaching out to the Backstitch people to see if I can interview them uh, for the channel. It will probably be taped because I think it would just be easier all around to do something pre-recorded and do like light editing. Also, there's not as much pressure on them. I know uh, live anything can be a little bit like nerve-wracking for people. So I don't want them to be like, real, like, I don't want them to be like super anxious about it. But I will reach out and see if they would be interested. I am 70 and sewing is a big part of my life. Uh, my daughter had home ec, one did not. Okay, so one daughter had home ec, one did not. Very interesting. All right, I'm going to cough again. Hold on a second. Uh, just finished with dinner. Are we talking about shows? Yes, we are. King the Land on Netflix is fun. I heard really good things about that show. I currently, here's what I'm going to do. I'm so cheap. I will probably get Netflix for like a couple months, watch what I need to, and then dump it again. Because Netflix is like, what, $15 a month or something now. It's gotten kind of crazy. So I'll probably do that. Watch a, I, I want to watch Queen of Tears, though. Queen of Tears looks awesome. And I love Kim, Kim Yoo-soon. Wait, Kim Soo-hyun? Who's the guy on it? He looks really good. All right, if one of my grandkids shows an interest, I will teach them. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'll probably be signing off very soon. But again, one last shout out here to this live stream sponsor, the Sewing Report Etsy shop. Check it out for your fabric and sewing supplies needs. Everything in the shop is personally chosen and curated, packaged, and shipped by me personally. So if you're interested, again, I know with everything going on with Joann's and some of the other online shenanigans, also this is, of course, a uh, small business. So if you like the channel, you like the live show, one way to support financially is by shopping supplies and fabric in the Sewing Report Etsy shop, and that's at sewingreport.etsy.com. And every... Again, I know a lot of you have already shopped with me already, and I greatly appreciate it, guys. And also, let me know in the comments if there's any topics and you're watching this on the replay and you'd like to see me cover, cover them here on Sewing Report Live. I'm always open to show topic suggestions. What would you like to see talked about here? Anyways, guys, I'm Jen with the Sewing Report. I greatly appreciate everyone watching tonight. I'll see you guys again. Oh, and by the way, we will be having an Easter Sunday show. It looks like we will be celebrating Easter on Saturday night. I know, my mom's idea, so it does look like we we are going to have a show next week on Easter Sunday at the same time. So it looks like we are going to be doing this. So if you're here and you want to hang out, you can. If you will be uh, celebrating and you, you can't be here, I totally understand. Uh, I do not have apparel fabrics on Sunday Park. I currently, not really... I have a couple knit fabrics that I do have to list. So currently I'm not able to offer apparel fabrics myself, um, but I do have a lot of quilting fabrics. Interesting that the couple from Backstitch are Norwegian. Wonder if the app is up and running there and successful. 
Yeah, it does declare they are Norwegian. Um, the app is still in beta testing worldwide, though, I believe. So, but yeah, they, I think it's cool. They seem like really nice people. On my next door app, there are more people seeking sewing instruction than I could teach. That's awesome. I now teach sewing in my studio. I find most young people have never held a needle. Well, I'm glad you're out there fighting the fight and trying to help people. I think that's awesome, and I think that is what we need. So, yes, next week there will be an Easter Sunday show, same time. Same place here on Sewing Report Live. I'm Jen with the Sewing Report. I'll see you guys again in the next one next week at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And remember, whatever you're doing, make it fun.